All right, nerd session number two. Here we go. Let's talk about Isaiah. Key concepts here. Um, you can all can see them. I don't need to repeat them to you. Um, first thing we're going to take a look at here is the issue of authorship. When we talk about the book of Isaiah, we need to understand that the book of Isaiah is actually three books in one. We refer to them in scholarship as first Isaiah, Deutero or second Isaiah, and then third or trito Isaiah. These three sections of the book of Isaiah represent the works of three distinctly different prophets who were living at three different times. Their work, for reasons that are not entirely clear to us, seems to have been merged together into one single book sometime around the year 400 BC or there, thereabouts. All right, now that's a bold statement for me to make, so I feel like I owe you some explanation for how we know this. And in fact, not only do I owe you this explanation, you're gonna need to be able to explain this back to me on the test. So here we go. The first reason why, the, the first thing that leads us to say that Isaiah is actually three books in one is the name Isaiah is not mentioned after chapter 39. All right, that in and of itself is not that significant. But when you combine it with the second point, I, I think you can see that we're, we're on to something here. In Isaiah chapter 6, we get the call story of Isaiah. We have a story about how God calls Isaiah to be a prophet. After that happens, um, Isaiah is a prophet and does his thing for the next 30 some odd chapters. But then in Isaiah chapter 40, right after we stop using Isaiah's actual name, we get the story of a prophet, an unnamed prophet, being called by God in Isaiah chapter 40. So this is a second instance when God calls upon a prophet to work for him, to spread his message for him. Well, why would we do that? Why do we need a second call story? Um, that's significant. Then when we look at chapter 45, we see that something very noteworthy is up. In chapter 45, we specifically mention a guy named Cyrus. He is the king of Persia. Now, when the original Isaiah, the first Isaiah, Isaiah from chapter 1 through 39, is doing his thing, Cyrus has not even been born yet. Uh, Cyrus is the king of a country that Isaiah is not worried about. Isaiah would be worried about the Assyrians. He would probably not have heard of the Persians if he has. They are not somebody he is worried about. But in chapter 45, we're talking about Cyrus, the king of Persia, and what he is going to do for the is what he is going to do for the Israelites. Now it's easy to say, well, prophets predict the future, and they do. You're right about that. But remember what we talked about before spring break, which depending on when you're watching this, I know it was at least two weeks ago. Um, prophetic predictions are usually near term, something that could be proven true within the lifetime of the prophet. Cyrus is living hundreds of years after the original Isaiah. In addition to that, we've also seen how oftentimes the prophetic predictions tend to be somewhat vague unless they can talk about something that's going to happen in the very, very immediate future. And so the idea of mentioning a person by name hundreds of years in the future is very inconsistent from what the prophets usually do. Those are the those first three bullet points here, I would say are significant and are pretty good evidence of us having at least two different Isaiahs. Now, to make your life a little bit easier, we'll combine bullet points four, five, and six 
and and you can just if you're taking notes just write this down as stylistic and theological differences as a simple explanation of this in the first 39 chapters of the book of isaiah he talks about the holiness of god whereas in the second half of the book of isaiah he tends to emphasize that god is the creator of the world that's his main attribute um these i don't think a stylistic or theological difference by itself proves anything but but this strong shift in the care in in how we describe the character of god from one from one part of the book to the next combined with the first three bullet points should be pretty good evidence to show us that we have multiple authors in the book of isaiah um so Key takeaways, especially for test purposes, first three bullet points uh, I want you to know for the test. The last three bullet points combine just this idea of stylistic and theological differences. Now you have a bullet point down at the bottom called pseudonymity. What this is, what pseudonymity means is it's when you write in you and you pretend to be somebody that you are not. So if these other if second Isaiah is pretending to be Isaiah or has or somebody has given him the persona of Isaiah by putting his work in the work of the first Isaiah, that would be an example of pseudonymity. Um, I deal with the issue of pseudonymity in a lot more detail in my New Testament class. For some students, it's very concerning that the Bible might contain um, people disguising their identities, um, perhaps some people might say lying. Um, uh, some students, this is a non-issue for them. If it is an issue for you, please send me an email and we will set up a, a way to, confer, to, to talk about it either via some email exchanges or we could do a, a Zoom or something like that and uh, we, we, can, we can deal with that. All right. So here we have historical context for first Isaiah. I don't have anything to really delve into here. I will explain the Syro-Ephraimite war in a little bit. Um, we'll, that'll come up when we talk about the predictions of Jesus here. There's the historical context for second Isaiah. You can see that we're living, that we're uh, more than 100 years into the future. The themes here, um, I'll let you read through those on your own. The only one that I want to highlight, and the only one that I really want you to pay attention to, especially for test purposes, is this one from Deuteronomy Isaiah that says, Yahweh is in control, there are no other gods. Make sure you are aware of that for test purposes. That's, that's a big theme in Deuteronomy Isaiah, and I'm going to highlight that, and I'll show you why, we, why I highlight that in about two more slides here all right isaiah chapter 2 he predicts peace not a lot more to say about that isaiah chapter 20 it's a funny interesting story there but i'm trying my best to keep these things a little bit more short and to the point um, so we're going to get over that as well and get to actually a story from second isaiah isaiah chapter 45 verses 1 through 7. now i'm going to read a couple of passages. I'm going to read this passage to you. Okay, so here's the passage. Now you can see on the PowerPoint here, I, I've obviously got two questions here, so you, you obviously know what I'm going to talk to you about here. So Isaiah chapter 45 says this, Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their robes to open doors before him and the gates shall not be closed. All right, let's stop there for a second. The way I've read it, that sounds, so what, no big deal. The, the translation that I'm using, which is the New Revised Standard Version here, has translated a word as anointed. In Hebrew, the word anointed is Messiah. And so what we have in Isaiah chapter 45 is on a slightly more literal level would be, thus says Yahweh to his Messiah, Cyrus. 
And so what's happened here is that Cyrus has been named the Messiah by God. This is, for some students, uh, so what, who cares? For other students, this is a surprising moment because usually Christians think of Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, hopefully this will help us understand the New Testament a little bit better um, by understanding what's going on with this word Messiah. The reason why the New Revised Standard Version here translates the word Messiah as anointed is because that's literally what the word means. Anybody can be a Messiah because to be the Messiah does not literally mean to be a person who is born of a virgin who will die on the cross for the sins of all humanity. To be the Messiah simply means to be the person who uh, is anointed by God, is specially chosen by God for a special purpose or a special mission. So oftentimes we will see people referred to as the anointed, and in the original Hebrew, it would be their being referred to as Messiahs. Jesus is a Messiah, absolutely. But when, he, when we call him Messiah in the New Testament, what we simply mean by that term is he is the Lord's anointed. He is on a special mission, on a special purpose from God. Now, Jesus's mission was a very different mission than what Cyrus was to do. Um, Jesus was supposed to die on the cross for the sins of humanity. Messiah's job is to save the Israelites, but save them in a very different way than Jesus saves them. So... <clears throat> What I'd like you to take note of here is that the term Messiah is simply a term that means anointed, and it is, uh, it, it's perfectly natural to call somebody other than Jesus the Messiah in the Old Testament. What would be surprising to the Israelites is that somebody who is not an Israelite, somebody who is not from their nation, could get, receive this title. Cyrus is the king of Persia. He is a foreigner. And so the idea that Cyrus could actually, Cyrus could receive this title, that's a big surprise to a lot of them. This goes hand in hand with what we talked about with Amos uh, a couple, uh, well, whenever you asked, watch the video. Um, Amos says, are the Ethiopians like the Israelites? The implied answer is yes, absolutely they are. Now we have another brief snippet of a discussion of what is the relationship between Israel and what is the relationship between Israel and foreigners. And here we see that God can choose foreigners to do his job. Um, and that would be and to act as as specially chosen people for God. That would be a surprising thing for the Jews. This is yet another way that God is beginning to try to stretch their understanding of what God's relationship is with his people and his people's relationship is to the rest of the world. So what Cyrus is going to do to be the Messiah is he is going to end the Babylonian exile. I know the last time we talked about this was before spring break, so it's easy to forget about this. A brief reminder, the Babylonian exile is the period that begins in 587 BC and continues on until 539 or 538 BC when Cyrus will allow the Israelites who were taken into captivity, taken to Babylon, he's going to conquer the Babylonians and then he's going to issue a decree that says the Israelites can return home to Israel. We refer to this as the, as the restoration. This is the third of four major dates that I want you to be aware of for test, for, uh, for test purposes this semester. I want you to know that in the year 539 or 538, Cyrus of Persia restored Israel, ended the Babylonian exile, and allowed the Israelites to return to their homeland. 
All right, let me, that was a lot about one verse there. So let me read a little bit more of this particular passage, because now we're going to talk about this second bullet point here, which I, I think some of you may be a little bit more intrigued by. We'll see. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to verse 4 for the sake of time. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 4. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I arm you, though you do not arm me. Excuse me, though you do not know me. So that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make good and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Okay. So, hopefully you picked up on, in verse 7 at the very end, we have an explicit statement of God says he is the maker of evil. And hopefully that's a little bit troublesome to you because usually within Christianity, we do not think of God as creating evil, as being mean to us like that. So why do we have this statement that God creates evil here? I'd love to have a discussion and, and, and delve into a lot of your different answers, but, well, yeah, that can't happen. So let's just jump right into it. And what I want you to notice here is that there's a buildup here. Starting in verse 5, we have this statement, I am Yahweh, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. Now, if you think about where we've been earlier in the semester, I t hopefully you remember this concept called monolatry. This idea of, or also we also called it henotheism, where the Jews were worshiping only Yahweh, but they believed that the other Israel, they believed the other gods were real. But here we have something different happening. We have a statement saying. I am Yahweh and there is no other. There's no other God besides me. That's different than what we found in, in, in Exodus and the first commandment where we said we may have no other gods before me. And then we continue on to the end of verse 6 and we have another statement like that. I am Yahweh, there is no other. And then he said, then we get to the troublesome passage. I make light and create darkness. I make good and create evil. What has been going on here in, the, in these previous two verses are statements of monotheism. Monotheism is the belief in one God and one God only. Isaiah is beginning to transition the Israelites from monolatry to monotheism. The Babylonian exile caused the Israelites to rethink and reflect on a lot of their theology. Tragedy will do that to you. Whether it's personal tragedy or whether it's national tragedy, tragedies make you reflect on things. The Israelites are no exception to that. So the Israelites are reflecting on this for uh, the Israelites are reflecting on these things and one of the things they began to think about was maybe it wasn't just that it was wrong of us to worship Baal and Asherah and all these other Bab Canaanite gods and goddesses maybe the problem was that they weren't real and they couldn't help us at all because they didn't exist. And so the Israelites begin to move towards monotheism and this new idea that 
there is only one God. Now, the consequence of having only one God is it's easy to blame the other gods in the world when something bad goes wrong. If you're, if somebody you know and love uh, gets sick from the from the COVID virus going around, um, if we believed in lots of gods, it would be easy for us to blame the god that we don't like on this. But when we have just one god, and we want to blame somebody for this. Well, now we create what's called the problem of monotheism. These bad things have to come from somewhere. And so the Israelites, at least in this brief moment, are willing to own up to the problem of monotheism, which is to say, if God is good and there's only one God, then where does evil come from? And they're willing to say that it comes from God at least in this brief moment here. And what, what Isaiah is doing in verse 7 is he is making this radical commitment to monotheism and directly rejecting this idea that there are other people in, or, or there are other beings up in heaven that we can blame for evil. Now, I've spent a lot of time on this slide, and I promise to, to speed up here in a second. Um, I want to talk about this just a little bit more. I am not trying to suggest that God, that that God is truly evil, or that this is the best explanation for the problem of evil. I would strong, if you're interested in this, I would strongly encourage you to take Dr. Robinson's philosophy class, where I think he delves into that. I don't think that this verse, though, is intended to give us the all-encompassing ultimate explanation of where evil comes from. Primarily what this verse is doing is simply trying to acknowledge and take seriously the idea of monotheism. I think that's ultimately what this verse is trying to do. So for test purposes, the big takeaway for this is why does God make evil? It is a statement of monotheism. We are acknowledging that there's only one God, and so at least in this particular moment, the Israelites are going to say that thus evil comes from God, thus there's only one God up there in heaven. If you are confused about what I've just said there, if you're confused about this particular issue, um, if you find this issue troublesome in any way, I again encourage you to send me, a, to, uh, send me an email. We'll set up a Zoom or we'll converse via email about uh, this issue. Um, all right, I think that's enough on that particular slide. So let's see if we keep moving a little bit here. All right, now we're going to go backwards, back to the book of, back to first Isaiah and the issue of the predictions of Christ. Now there are predictions of Christ to be found throughout, uh, throughout the prophetic books, but the, but the book that features the most or at least the most popular ones, the most well-known, is certainly the book of Isaiah. Um, that's probably because the book of Matthew likes to use the book of Isaiah or the, uh, to, to show that Jesus was the, was the Messiah, the, um, uh, the long-expected Savior of Israel. Um, we, so let's take a closer look at Let's take a closer look at what Isaiah is trying to get at here in these predictions of Christ. Um, Isaiah 7.14 is one of the more popular, more, more well-known predictions. And you can see that there's a difference, that, that there's a difference between the way the NRSV translates this verse and the King James Version translates this verse. And the big difference is whether a young woman is going to have a child or a virgin is going to have a child. Um, the reason for this discrepancy goes back to the Septuagint. What's the Septuagint? Hopefully everybody remembers it's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The King James Version is choosing to translate 
consistent with the Septuagint understanding of this verse, which is that the Hebrew word, the Hebrew word that is being translated as virgin there, is the, is the word Alma. But in the Septuagint, the way they translate that word Alma, which literally means young woman, they translate that word to mean virgin. And so the King James Version chooses to use that understanding because it's consistent with because it's consistent with the way Matthew understands the verse because Matthew seems to be quoting the Septuagint version of this passage. Now the New Revised Standard Version chooses to go with a more literal understanding of the Hebrew word Alma which is young woman, or more specifically, young woman of right age and disposition for childbearing. That's probably the most technical definition we could give. And so this poses the question, which one's right? What's, what's going on here? What, what, what's significant about this? Well, the when when we translate this as virgin, it makes it immediately clear that this is verse must be talking about Jesus because Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary in the New Testament. But if we translate this verse as young woman, it's not as obvious that we're talking about that we are talking about Jesus in this case. The context of this passage the context of this passage is something known as the syro ephraimite War. What it was, it was a coalition between the Syrians and the northern kingdom of Israel. That's the Ephraimites. Ephraim is another name for the northern kingdom of Israel. It was a coalition of the Syrians and the Ephraimites to attack the southern kingdom where Isaiah was working as a prophet at the time to try to replace King Ahaz. And so King Ahaz is in his throne room, surrounded by the Syrian and Ephraimite army. And he is afraid that he is going to be defeated by this army and replaced by somebody else, somebody not from the lineage of David, and that he would be the last king of the southern kingdom, potentially. And so he's in his throne room when Isaiah walks in to offer up these words that we find in chapter 7, verse 14. And I want you to close your eyes and think for a second. What would give Ahaz who is worried about being defeated and being the last king of the southern kingdom and is worried this army is going to come and destroy him, what would give him more comfort? Option number one, where Isaiah says, don't worry, King Ahaz, 700 years from now, a kid is going to be born in a stable in Bethlehem to take away the sins of the world. Or option number two, don't worry, King Ahaz. The Lord is going to give you a sign. Look over there. The young woman, that's probably a reference to one of his queens, somebody who he's married to. She's going to have a baby. And you're going to name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. We don't have to take the word Emmanuel, God with us, to mean literally God in the flesh is with us, we can use it in that more spiritual sense of to say that God is, God, may God bless America, may God be with us on our quest, or something like that. And so the second option is to propose that Isaiah is trying to suggest, is not trying, he is point blank saying, Ahaz, God is giving one of your queens a son, which would mean you have an heir to the throne. And God's giving you an heir to the throne 
that means you're not going to be the last king of Israel, uh, of the southern kingdom. You're not going to be deposed. You're not going to be defeated in this war. So in the immediate context, I would guess that most of you are now thinking, ah, option two makes more sense. It's consistent with our understanding of what prophets like to predict, things that are going to happen in their lifetime, in the short term, not 700 years into the future. And prophets usually speak about situations that are relevant to them and to their immediate audience. So Isaiah 7.14, in context, is probably about the future king Hezekiah. It is probably a prediction of the future king Hezekiah. Hezekiah is spelled H-E-Z-E. K-I-A-H, Hezekiah. So most, and in fact, we think most of these other predictions that are supposedly about Christ in their original context were actually about Hezekiah in their immediate context. Now, I'll say one more brief word, and then we'll be done here. Just because this is originally about Hezekiah doesn't mean it can't also be about Jesus. It's, I think it's perfectly fair and reasonable to say that there can be layers of meaning within Scripture. And so I think it's okay for us to see that maybe God spoke to Isaiah in such a way that his prophecy would be meaningful to both his immediate context, but would also have meaning to the, to the Gospel of Matthew and to some of the other Gospel writers 700 years into the future. I think that's okay for us to think that way. But what I, do, but what I want you to really come to terms with and, and understand here is that even these predictions of Jesus are probably not really in their original context meant to be about Jesus. They are very consistent with our overall understanding of prophets that they're usually short that they're usually making predictions that are short term and that they're usually speaking to their immediate context here. And so these predictions would all be about King Hezekiah here. All right. Uh, okay, so we've got this last slide here, but I don't see a need to go over it again, go over it, because uh, what we have here are four different what we call suffering servant songs in which we have a description of a servant who would suffer for the sake of God's people. Usually, oftentimes, Christians read these as other predictions of Christ, and I think that that's a reasonable reading of these passages. But again, in the original historical context, these songs were probably originally about either the prophet Isaiah himself or perhaps the nation of Israel in that particular moment. Uh, so once again, in the original context, they're probably not meant to be about Jesus, but layers of scripture allows us to say, well, they could also be about Jesus in addition to whoever that original figure was. All right, that's everything from the book of Isaiah. Um, uh, I think I'll just stop here.